Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we have a very special guest today. Um, we have uh, Dr. Anthony Pilney and um, we're going to be covering parrot confiscations and their welfare, welfare implications. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pilney. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, just as we wait for people to log on, I, I think um, uh, uh, you, 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 know, you, you know Dr. Lamb pretty well. Is that right? Yes. Yep, Stephanie Lamb, who many people are used to seeing here pretty regularly, and I are co-workers. Yeah, so we work at the same hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's familiar. I mean, it's, you guys are, uh, that's that's awesome. I mean, we are, we are so fortunate to to get um, just such a, a, a wonderful um, opportunity to, to speak with vets. I mean, it's just an awesome. I, I we're so, so excited to have you on today. And also... Um, you have a screen share for us. So I'll, uh, in a little bit, I'll let you start that. But I wanted to remind people that um, if we have any questions, we'll try to get to them at the end um, of the webinar. And um, let's see, we, yeah, we're, we've, we've, looks like we're going to have a pretty good house with us today, so to speak, as far as people uh, tuning in. Um, yeah. And once again, if you have any questions, we'll try to get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, but do we have a, I'm sure this is going to be a pretty, um, uh, in depth and probably maybe a little emotional webinar for some people because the topic so it's such a um, such an emotional topic in many ways. So I'm going to let you get started, Dr. Filney. And once again, thanks thanks for joining us and uh, and thanks for putting together a, a presentation. That's even better because we can go back and watch it, um, so we don't have to uh, uh, take too many notes. All right, here we go. Well, thank you again for that introduction and. We really appreciate the opportunity to have this platform and be able to share these topics and discussions. Um, and it, you know, we're taking a, a slight deviation from the typical avian veterinary medicine focus, but we're talking about something that's really, really important for any bird people, whether you are veterinarians, uh, care for birds, just love them. I think as we run through this discussion and talk about this, and, and as you alluded, it, it may be emotional for some people and it should be, because as we discussed, this is what's happening in the real world. So today we're gonna to talk about confiscations and really what we're talking about is illegal trafficking, poaching, essentially the kidnapping or stealing of, of birds from the wild and getting those into wherever they land. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the process and procedures, what happens. And then as I always like to do, we'll, we'll put some solutions in. So we don't want, want to always talk about problems without talking about solutions, without talking about ideas, without being part of the solution as well. So we'll talk about how veterinarians, people caring for birds, and just bird lovers can really help with this terrible situation. So this is the sad truth of what's happening in the world. Um, you know, we see these, these birds that are poached for their value, and we see these birds that are part of a, a sad wildlife trade that actively goes on. And when we see pictures like this, Customs and Border Patrol checking the trunk of this car to see all these poached Amazon baby birds, you know, hoping to get those to a destination where they can be sold. And, you know, we see the image here on the, the right and we think what a terrible existence for those birds. Like I think any of us that own birds or care or preach about care would never think this is how a bird should spend 20, 30, 40 years of their lives Although the sad truth is most of these birds in third world countries live five to six years anyway. Um, and you can see why with these conditions. And so we'll start off talking about the sad truth by this quote from um, Dr. Laura Kim Joyner. Um, you know, that there is harm to these birds everywhere that they are sought for trade or to be put into the domestic pet trade. Everything from when they're initially caught, transported, placed, held in quarantine, the entire process has the potential for harm and suffering. And so we'll go through some of that and have a, have a discussion and point some of that out. Articles in the paper, why is everyone stealing parrots? I mean, that's the million dollar question. Open up um, Google and do a search, you'll find million hits. We'll see pictures of birds, newspapers, um, news articles. We have people who are stopped in airports who think they're going to get through when they figure out a way to hide all these, you know, in hummingbirds basically in their pants, um, trying to get through security and hope they aren't caught. Birds found in in luggage and and attempts to move them through. So we're talking about the global wildlife trade. This is a multi-billion dollar trade in 
animals and illegal animals. And it, it's really compared to the the trade that we know of in illegal drugs and illegal guns. I mean, it's a, such a huge financial gain. Birds are popular and they're desired. People want them. People want them in places where they can't get them. And there's enough supply and demand that people can buy them and expect to have them available. The trade is driven by the market's demand, by huge profits, and then rural poverty. And I think that's what we often forget when we start thinking about the empathy we might need to show in some of these situations, because these are poor people who don't have money. And sometimes selling these baby birds that they've stolen from a nest is the only way they can provide food for their family or clothes for their children and, and buy gas to get to school. So we do have to consider that that is a huge drive for what's happening here. The countries with the very high demand for legal wildlife are the same as those that want illegally obtained wildlife. The USA, China, the European Union are the biggest consumers of these birds. And in the box here, just to highlight next to this sad picture, you know, the lack of enforcement of laws is a huge conservation challenge. Illegal practices are sometimes viewed as socially acceptable. And if you think about that, there's really no way that you can fight that. There's no local law enforcement. There's no federal law enforcement. This trade goes on and, and sometimes people look the other way or don't feel like it's worth their time. They've got bigger crimes and bigger issues to deal with than worry that somebody's trying to sell a baby bird that they took out of a nest. When we consider about what is legal and what is illegal, remember 1992 Wild Bird Conservation Act, the US banned the import of captured uh, birds. And so we knew that we were no longer allowed to bring those birds into the country so we had to figure out a way to get more birds. Well, aviculture and controlled breeding stepped in, but it's not enough. And so we still see this illegal wildlife trade. Significant number of captive birds and parrots now in homes are wild caught or taken from the wild. And we know that these parrots are suffering, suffering devastating depletion of their populations. If you wanna take some time and look at endangered parrots in Central and South America and look at these species, they're not far from paralleling those that we keep in our homes or that we see in pet stores. So, um, and it goes much more far reaching. Habitat destruction, um, altering indigenous people's cultures and beliefs, destruction of natural resources. I mean, there are so many ways that we see responsibility or actions that lead to the number of species that are at risk of extinction. And we know that both the legal and the illegal wild bird trade absolutely plays a huge role in the global decline of parrot populations in the world. And again, we say legal versus illegal because there is still some legal and acceptable trading and importation of wild caught birds destined for the, for the pet trade. Again, the number of intercepted and seized birds and eggs is a very small percentage of all that are poached and smuggled. And again, it's quite easy to pull up any headlines, any news articles. Um, you can find these anywhere. This, this happens all the time, whether it makes major news and anybody reports on it. You know, we're not always so lucky that these baby birds are going to be chir chirping and, and squabbling and making sounds that alert anybody. And certainly when they're smuggling eggs, like this article here, you see it's dated March 12, 2024. This is recent, 240 macaw eggs being smuggled out. So, you know, they're, they're sometimes found. And when they're found, we know about it. And when we know about it, we can track it and keep that information. But we very rarely know about the full extent of everything happening here. So when we look at some of the facts and, and some of the ways that we have these seizures and the, the authorities that we rely on, you can see this map here showing basically the ports that have the highest number of cases. And then when we get U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service information, they can report and list and make that information available. We can see the numbers and we can see the live specimens and we can break that up amongst all of those that are kidnapped. Interestingly, the, the largest group of animals that are poached and stolen and smuggled are coral, but birds and reptiles are not far behind. So they have these ports of entries and they have ways around this. And we're going to talk about the challenges that this leads to. Um, when we try to use CITES information and we try to get that, that 
those numbers, those statistics, and we're trying to look at this, we can just sort of see graphs here that show the trends in the species that are most commonly confiscated. And these are the ones that are most desired in the pet trade. And these are the birds that we think of are the most common birds that we see. Now, CITES information doesn't include eggs. It doesn't include bones, feathers, anything else that's bird related. These are just live birds. And again, you can see here the species that are being brought in are the most common. It sort of goes in waves based on the decade and based on people's interests. But we know that gray parrots are very popular and sought after companions. Many people who are interested in large parrots move towards the macaws um, and those type of species. And then, of course, the huge variety of Amazon species, whether they are true Amazon or currently getting renamed based on, on correct nomenclature, but those are the more commonly tame birds. And when we look at who's most threatened, look at the number of illegal live parrot trade seizures, even in these dated periods of time, we start seeing a lot of overlap. We start seeing the same birds showing up from different sources and different information. And we start seeing who's being taken from where and who's attempting to get these birds across illegally to get them into probably whoever's willing to pay for them, who's willing to buy them, but many of them are landing into the pet trade and many of them are becoming pets. So I have some images um, that are taken either from it, personal experiences by people who do this work. Some of these are, are taken from newspaper articles, publications, but they should generate an emotional response. I mean, anybody who loves and cares about birds has to be sickened by the the degree of what we think is is immeasurable suffering and 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 a tragedy that we see happening before us. These birds um, collected baby birds. I mean, think if you've ever raised a baby bird, think about how much work it is to raise one baby bird. Could you imagine that we're now looking for somebody who's willing to take on 20, 30, maybe 200 baby birds in an attempt to not let those birds die or to not have to euthanize those birds simply because there's nobody to care for them. So these images again are directly from smuggled attempts or ways that people have um, been able to try to bring these birds across borders and have been caught. Again, where do we get data? Where do we get information? Where do we get actual statistics? Well, the CITES database does not include birds that were not covered by CITES. Um, birds that are sent back over the border. So when somebody intercepts a vehicle, like that first picture of that trunk with all those baby birds, and they're told, go back where you came from, you're not allowed to cross. We don't track that information. Those birds that are euthanized for various number of reasons, and then the number of illegally trafficked birds. And that's the key thing is there's no way to know how many, how often, and when that happens, along with all those seizures that occur on a global scale. And that's one of the more sort of disheartening parts of it. And um, we see these birds transported in any way possible, crowded conditions, inhumane situations. Um, many of these birds suffer and die. The legal trade, not illegal, but the legal trade in gray parrots from Africa has an allowance of up to 50% death rate in getting those birds into the pet trade. Um, it's almost like they say, okay, well, if we trap 5,000 birds, half of them are going to die before they get somewhere where they can get in someone's home. And that's a horrible statistic to have to accept when you think about what's going on here. So this is largely the, the main part of what we're talking about here, how it all works to be a little sarcastic or doesn't work. So just to go through the process of what happens, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the regulatory agency responsible for confiscated birds. Customs and Border Patrol are the ones who find the birds and do the seizures and report it, but they're reporting to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Hey, we have 20 birds here that are not supposed to be coming in. We've been able to take them from the person, but now we don't keep them. They have to go somewhere. So Fish and Wildlife Service will step in but they have to notify the USDA, who we know is responsible for quarantine and disease control. So we have birds that have been attempted to come in, they've been seized, they have to go somewhere in case they have diseases, in case they're coming in with anything. Um, the USDA has to protect our poultry industry. They have to protect and control 
disease coming in. So USDA or the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service will provide that quarantine for the birds, but that is largely all they do. Customs or U.S. Fish and Wildlife will transfer those birds to the USDA who assume any necessary health activities and quarantine. And as we talk a little bit more, we'll go through some of sort of the negative aspects and what's missing in this. But following quarantine, the USDA has no responsibility towards those birds. They're going to have to go back to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as soon as possible or following legal proceedings or back to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because they've got to decide what happens from that point. There is only one avian quarantine station located in New York State, regardless of where those birds are moving from. If they're going to be quarantined, they're going to New York State and they cannot accept unweaned chicks. And sadly, a huge amount of these seizures are unweaned chicks and there's nobody to care for those and no money for that. Uh, that means those birds often have to be destroyed. Unfortunately, these birds may all be euthanized regardless of CITES protection or even if they're endangered or threatened species. Here's an opportunity, but they are unweaned baby birds and there's just nobody to care for them. So um, if the U.S. Fish and Wildlife object to this practice, they can intervene. But we don't have the quarantine facilities, the holding facilities, and we don't have always the proper care. And this is basically an infographic of how it works. Customs and Border Patrol find the birds. Fish and Wildlife takes possession. They go to quarantine in the USDA. They go back to Fish and Wildlife Service. They're held for, for evidence. They're held for investigation or they're released. But the biggest, biggest, biggest problem is where do they go after that? Um, you know, zoos are not always an option. Sanctuaries are not an option. Um, what happens now that you've got 20, 30, 200 homeless baby birds where are they going to go? So again, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services is the regulatory agency responsible, but we'll talk a little bit more about some of the challenges. So when we think about the USDA, again, they're providing that mandatory quarantine. Undocumented birds may be sent back over the border, brought into quarantine, or euthanized. Those are really the only three options we have, because if they're going to cross the border and come into the U.S., they have to go into quarantine. There is only that one facility. USDA will examine the birds, potentially run some testing. Non-endangered species are often euthanized immediately. And then following quarantine, the USDA no longer has any jurisdiction, responsibility, or involvement in these birds. They're solely there to try to protect and prevent disease transmission. So here are the big issues. Who's paying for all this? None of us can imagine how expensive all of this would be. Who's doing the work? All of these organizations are not employing avian veterinarians or, or bird care specialists or people who have raised birds. I mean, these are people who may or may not know anything about caring for birds, let alone caring for unweaned three to four week old chicks that need very specialized care. Um, confiscated birds can legally re-enter the pet trade, which is always of concern. And then we have to always consider, is the euthanasia of these birds to alleviate suffering? Or is it because we don't have anything to do with them? Are they coming across and being seized and there's no money, time, or place for them to go? And the only option we're left with is euthanizing what are potentially healthy baby birds. So serious things to consider, volunteer programs, workshops, training, this is not all available. I mean, people that work at Customs and Border Control are not, may not even be pet people, may not be animal people. They may not even care so much about what comes across as long as they do their job. And so we don't have a network of people involved in this who are people who are committed to birds and their care and their welfare. And that's a huge, huge problem that people on the ground face all the time. So. You know, what are culprits charged with? Maybe regulatory violations, um, animal cruelty, welfare charges. Fish and Wildlife Service and our USDA, our government agencies, don't generally have the funding, people, support staff to take legal action. They may do what they can to deal with the problem at hand, but they're not in the business of attempting to bring these criminals to justice. But then after that, who is? Chances are no one. So people can get away with this. Um, and smugglers and organized crime, which we know is a big part of this, 
are generally not brought to justice on these issues. And, and that's a serious ongoing problem. Many of you know that as of last year, birds are now covered under the Animal Welfare Act for the first time in our history. So at least we have our first step towards legal protections. But again, most often there's no action taken against these people. So what happens after? Like we started discussing, where do these birds end up? Where do they go? Who takes them? People often say, why can't we send them back? Why can't we release them? Why can't we raise them and then take them back where they were stolen from? It's a huge undertaking with lots of legal obstacles, expenses. And even though what we call repartition, you know, sending them back to where they're from after they're stable for release is an almost impossible task. Although we have more of that happening than ever. And that's maybe becoming slightly more attainable than it has been in the last 20 or 30 years. There's not a lot of places for these birds to go. I was at um, the Association of Avian Veterinarians conference last month, and there was a, a talk um, by a good friend of mine, and she was talking on this topic, and she basically jokingly asked the audience, is there anybody in here that has a lot of money, a lot of land, wants to build a facility and then pay for a team of people to take care of hundreds of baby birds? You know, and jokingly, no one raised their hands, but I mean, that's the reality of what it would take. And that's not the reality of what we generally see. So there's just not that financial support. It's always about money. Money is always the issue. So where do they go? Well, animal shelters are the new place that unwanted pet birds are landing, but they're ill-equipped to take birds, let alone confiscated baby birds. Zoos often can't take them. They're not gonna expose collections and they're not gonna take birds they don't need and they don't have money and they don't have enclosures and they don't have room for. And then another serious problem that I often talk about, and I just gave a lecture as well at the Avian Vets Conference, sanctuaries and rescues are full, overflowing, at capacity. There's nowhere for a lot of these birds to go. Unfortunately, those could get easily filled in a short amount of time if they were able to take more. So, you know, who does what here? It's complicated with multiple agencies involved. Various law enforcement entities can seize the birds. But what happens then? So we have to think about the channels that it's supposed to go through, the way this is supposed to happen, the organizations that are involved, and then what action do they actually really take? Again, in some cases, local and municipal laws may supersede what happens with these birds as well. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, some of this is considered to be socially acceptable in some of these rural communities and small villages and, and these places in, in Central and South America. So again, what are the problems we're really dealing with? Just to kind of summarize, quarantine, we know. Um, birds must be returned to the southern border following quarantine, but where? USDA does not care for unweaned birds. They don't have the resources, the facility, the ability they can't feed baby birds three, four, five times a day. That's just not going to happen. And it's more humane then to let those birds be euthanized than to have them starve and wither away and die on our soil. Quarantine tests for only a few diseases, but these birds may be carrying other um, potential diseases. And then private quarantine licensure is possible, but that's only geared towards poultry and certainly protecting our huge, valuable poultry industry in this country. Again, disposition of the birds is limited. Repartition, as we talked about, is very difficult due to regulations, national laws. It's a lot more than somebody being able to fly a couple carriers full of baby birds and, and release them. It's so much more complicated and it's not something that really isn't part of the norm in what we're doing. And as I mentioned, lifelong housing is difficult for wild parrots. Sanctuaries are full, and these birds ideally should not be put into the pet trade. They are wild animals. They should not be put into the pet trade. Again, funding. Who's paying for it? There's no budget to support this. There's no training for customs um, and border patrol employees. There's no training for some of the people that care for these birds all along the legal route from seizure to disposition. So it does lead to certain problems. There's not financial support for any of these activities um, or by any of the confiscating groups. And compensation from legal prosecution rarely covers anything. If we think we're gonna get money from these people that attempt to smuggle these poached birds to cover any part of it, it's not gonna happen. I mean, I think that's not an area that we would ever consider as a reality for funding in this.
But what solutions are there? You know, what can we do? This is one of those, this webinar that Lefebvre is graciously having us discuss this topic and, and provide education and, and enhance people's knowledge, um, but supportive relations with agencies, awareness around the seizure quarantine disposition maze, familiarization with legal processes, maybe another quarantine facility, maybe one staffed with people who can care for the birds better and increase the likelihood of survival and then mutual aid between sanctuaries that provide care. If you think about it, if a private bird sanctuary says, I've got room for birds, and they get a call from Fish and Wildlife Service who says, great, I've got 172 um, baby Amazon parrots, that sanctuary may not have the funding to care for that number of birds. But other solutions, again, network of sanctuaries that can offer care and make that the norm for these birds. Parrot rehabilitation, release experts, people who can learn and, and teach how to rewild birds, guidelines for care. This is something that ironically doesn't even really exist. These birds come into care and people don't even have basic guidelines for permits, licensing, feeding, weighing, and caring for the birds. Um, fundraising, fundraising, that's one of the things we'll always hear. Everything takes money. So education of people involved in parrot care education of donors and education to everybody about the plight of these confiscated birds and what a sort of tragic, terrible existence it could be. So now we're gonna switch a little bit towards the veterinary aspects of confiscations and talk more about what happens with the veterinarian, the veterinary care provider, those people who are working on the ground, rescuing these birds, trying to ensure their survival, um, anybody involved in this sort of from the ground up. So some of these aspects, and, and this part even gets a little bit sadder because by the time a veterinarian actually gets to see these birds, they may have experienced terrible suffering and injury and harm. Minimizing pain and suffering is integral to the practices, but keep in mind, these are wild animals. They are treated as such, seen as such, and it's different than what we think about the gold standard for our pets. This is basically wildlife medicine is often a flock health or herd health and it, it's operating without huge amounts of money. So veterinarians can play a role in assuring that captive husbandry is based on good practices, good standards, planned protocols, health screening, and evaluating birds that may be available for the potential to ever get them released. And policy making, leadership, writing protocols, bridging the disciplines and, and devoting their time. And again, this is not only veterinarians, this is anybody involved in this has to step out of just the actual part of caring and feeding for these birds and thinking of ways we could make the entire situation better. So what are veterinarians and those caring for these birds gonna expect with this? Certainly injuries and trauma along the way, captivity stress, inappropriate care, diseases, environmental issues, and emotional pain. And we'll touch a little bit on each of these. Again, each one of these could potentially be a talk on its own, but we'll touch a little bit as we cover the sort of general idea of what's going on. Well, how do these birds get hurt? Well, they hurt when they're caught. They're hurt when they're smuggled and trafficked. Cage trauma, transport injuries. Think about stuffing all these cockatoos into water bottles. I mean, when you think about where those birds are, overcrowding, small cages, attempts to make it soundproof. Um, any of these methods may lead to it. This is just a short list of the number of trapping methods that exist. And, and unfortunately, even though they're hoping for a live bird, this is a huge area where injury occurs. Birds that are netted, caught in glue, um, any, any method that they use to catch birds could lead to trauma and lead to severe injuries, all of these up to and including death. As we mentioned, cage trauma, being overly crowded for transport, lesions from birds trying to escape, um, trauma to each other from fear and stress, intense soiling, unhygienic conditions, lacerations, cuts to the skin, bite wounds, um, not to mention things that are, are fitting with starvation and dehydration and exhaustion and extreme levels of stress and panic and anxiety. And these are ways these birds are transported. Again, soda bottles, tubes, 
Um, there was a recent story about somebody trying to transport small passerines and hair curlers. And they stuffed the birds in the little old fashioned hair curlers and hoped nobody would notice that there were birds in there. This picture at the top was a, a birds that were attempted to be smuggled across the water. And when customs saw them, they just threw the birds into the water. I mean, these were birds that are unable to swim or float and they were forced to just net out a hundred dead birds. So um, think about the potential here for injury and trauma and what happens in transport. So what are veterinarians and care people dealing with? Broken bones, entanglement, the use of projectiles to get these birds. Um, I wanna to touch a little bit on bleaching because I think most people don't know about that. And we had a little discussion before the webinar started um, about the awareness. And so we'll touch on that and then fall injury. So you, you can't not deny the potential for broken bones, for trauma, for injuries. You see here birds with splints on their broken wings an x-ray with the broken bone. Um, and then we see projectiles. I mean, sometimes birds have to be shot out of trees. Sometimes bullets, pellets, um, slingshots, anything is used and these can cause severe trauma. I mean, they always hope that it's not going to prevent them from being sold, but those things can seriously injure these birds and they're part of the whole process. Entanglement and strings, in nets, um, material getting caught around them, toes getting caught in cages, accidental amputations, any degree of trauma from entanglement from any method of procurement of these birds. Burns, um, burns from wildfires. I mean, it's become a practice for poachers to try to burn the surrounding areas and try to use fire as a way to scare away birds so that they can get into nests. Um, you know, attempting to feed baby birds, we know that crop burning is a real issue. If somebody doesn't know how to do it, there's the potential they can cause trauma and certainly superficial burns and, and injuries, respiratory damage, smoke inhalation, singed feathers. If they're exposed anywhere to fire, heat or burns, it can cause problems. As I mentioned, I wanted to touch on intentional bleaching. Um, it's a it's a disgusting and horrific um, developed technique, which is basically akin to dying hair like we think about in people. But what they're doing is they're bleaching the natural color from these species and then using food coloring or hair dyes or other methods to change the physical appearance of these birds. And it's interesting because as Brenda mentioned in the beginning of the or before we started the talk, you know, sometimes veterinarians are shown a picture and somebody says, what kind of bird is this? And it's sort of like that doesn't fit with any species and it may have been bleached or color altered because, you know, a bird that may only sell for 5,000 now might sell for 7,000. So um, food coloring, but what happens is sometimes these birds suffer burns, chemical burns of the eyes, trauma to the face, respiratory irritation. I mean, they're essentially trying to bleach the color pigment out of their feathers and they're trying to create new birds like these. These are not, not color patterns that are normal. This is an attempt to make this bird look different and make them more valuable. So this whole intentional bleaching of these birds is part of the wildlife trade and it's creating another area of unnecessary but terrible suffering, trauma, injury and pain for these birds, not to mention the fact that these are going to grow out. We know that birds molt their feathers and they drop those old ones and replace them with new ones. So somebody who just spent an extra $5,000 to buy this rare, unusual yellow headed Quaker um, is not going to have that for a long time. And so that leads to other problems. But this bleaching is happening in our world today. And it's quite upsetting. Fall injuries, um, you know, there are attempts at um, trying to get into these nest cavities. This is a picture that shows, you know, birds don't build perfectly square nest holes. This is what a chainsaw does when somebody's trying to get into that nest cavity because there are eggs or baby birds in there. Um, sometimes they chop the entire tree down. It's my understanding that if the nest site is too high or there's not a way to get to it, poachers may actually chop the entire tree down. If the birds survive, great. If they don't, they move on to the next tree. And that's quite sad. Um, if you think about it as well, one of the things that we forget is uh, 
is how traumatic it is for the parent birds. I mean, we know that birds are doting parents. We know they care for their young. We know that wild animals are fiercely committed to protecting their offspring and ensuring that they fledge. And um, there are videos showing parent birds reacting to coming back to their nests and finding their baby birds gone and the, the imaginable trauma and stress that is to these birds to have devoted the time and raised the bird. And then three weeks later, it's suddenly gone or two birds. or So um, that's a serious issue. You know, falling injuries, birds that are accidentally dropped. This has been seen a lot. Poachers will climb the tree. Sometimes on their way down, they fall or the bird falls. They drop to the ground. Um, everything from broken bones all the way to death. And that's a serious problem. So these fall injuries are 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 another area where these birds are irrevocably being harmed. Again, in captivity and inappropriate care, from the time these baby birds are taken till the time they can be sold, they don't have access to nutriberries. They don't have access to high quality food. They, you know, these birds are fed scraps. They're fed beans and rice. They, you know, they're anything they can do. And if the birds don't know how to eat on their own, there's often not somebody feeding them enough. So they're gonna have stunted growth. So. We have to consider that along with dehydration and starvation. No access to food. Most of us know that baby birds until a certain age don't eat or drink at all on their own. They are 100% dependent on their parents or somebody to feed them and meet their nutritional and hydration needs. And if that doesn't happen, it's going to lead to death. Starvation, malnutrition, feeding the wrong food. Assuming that you can drop some dog food in there and the birds can chew on dry dog food kibble if they're adults and they'll learn to eat that. I mean, it's it's sad, but these are the truth of it. Rotted fruit, vegetables, um, sometimes bulk seeds and nuts, but some of these birds are too sick to actually be able to eat food, shell nuts, shell seeds. They're, they're just weak and, and already compromised. So inappropriate practices, hand feeding, um, humans chewing up food and spitting it into the bird's mouth as an attempt to feed them. Um, and so any range of diseases and any range of trauma from malnutrition as well. And then ex-captive here we see with a, a baiting bird to attract other birds. Um, terror and stress, inappropriate husbandry. Um, some of these birds are used to help them catch more birds you know, irreparable damage happens to these birds. I mean, many people look at this image and have described what they believe there's an intense amount of, of fear and anxiety in this bird. And this whole, this bird's whole life is to help these people trap and net and capture more birds for the illegal trade. Not to mention infectious diseases. We know that there is the potential for these birds to um, harbor infectious diseases. We often sometimes accept that in the wild, Mother Nature has devised ways for symbiotic relationships. And when they're in the wild, certain parasites or certain diseases are not going to be as deadly until they are under stress, compromised, starving, dehydrated, and then those become problems. But we also have to consider the zoonotic disease potential. Zoonotic diseases are those that these birds can transmit to people. Um, when we think about certain diseases, fungal diseases, chlamydia, tuberculosis, there's a number of those. And we have to consider the possibility. We know that's a fact. We know that was a big part of in the early 1900s, the mass collection when everybody wanted green parrots and they were bringing them up from South America. And all those birds had chlamydia. And once they got into a home and were being fed the wrong way and had no access to flight and sunshine, they broke with clinical disease that maybe they might have been able to deal with in the wild. So we have to consider infectious diseases as well. And then keep in mind, environmental degradation favors this. So another whole area, but directly involved is what's happening. Habitat destruction, loss of food, intentional burning so that the birds have to choose less trees, makes it easier for someone to collect their eggs, to know where their nest sites are. Removal of food so that the birds don't go as far away, they stay in smaller areas. Um, you know, urban development, movement of people closer into natural areas, deforestation, logging, um, and then any intentional activity that somebody does in order to make it easier for them to steal baby birds it's all part of the whole trafficking issue and it all favors that to some degree.
And the last part that we're going to talk about is what do veterinarians and volunteers actually do? And again, we touched on a few solutions earlier, and we'll talk a little bit more about solutions and what we can do. But what can anybody do? What can all of us, even just talking about this, learning about it, and knowing it's a real problem, do to help this? And certainly with veterinary care, the basics, veterinarians, physical examination, sample collection, blood testing, disease screening, parasite treatments, any number of veterinary care to further increase the likelihood of survival of these birds. Meticulous record keeping is vital. If there's ever going to be legal prosecutions, it requires two things, meticulous record keeping and photographs and photo documenting everything, every single thing. If you're ever involved in any kind of hoarding or confiscation of any kind of animal, I've been involved in a number of them, even, even rabbit breeders that have 200 rabbits, photographs are going to be the most incriminating thing. You've got to take pictures of everything and make sure that we document it. Quarantine, enforcing quarantine. We don't want to spread diseases. We don't want to intermix birds that have never been around other species or other types of birds. We want to limit how much isolation we do of birds, but we have to be mindful. But we often forget about quarantine and the need for that. I mean, people often forget about quarantine in their pet birds. They, they lose a bird, they need a new friend, they go and they pick up a new budgie and they forget that they should quarantine it before they introduce it to their existing pet birds. So maintaining strict biosecurity is paramount. And sometimes this work is done in the field, it's done on the ground, it's done in a tent, but we still have to think about ways to quarantine these birds. Treatment and hospital care, certainly record keeping, as I mentioned, is vitally important best practices, providing any level of care, even if it's a makeshift hospital, we can do things to help these birds. We can, we can make sure they're identified. We can make sure they have physical exams. They've got food and water. They've got a safe, dry, warm place to stay while we're trying to sort out where we can send them, what we can do with them, and what the future holds for them. And probably one of the more important things to consider is prognostics. You know, prognostically, where do we go with this? What's the level of suffering these animals experience? Can we minimize that pain and suffering? Can we help them and ensure that they don't continue to suffer? Adults and healthy young birds are gonna have a much better prognosis than baby birds, neonates, newborns, and certainly the smuggling of eggs. It's, it's thought now that it's probably easier to move an egg than a baby bird it's probably a better chance of hiding it. It's probably more likely that it's gonna get through um, customs or through an inspection than an actual live bird. So the severity of injury, response to treatment, make decisions early. Keep in mind, there are not sanctuaries for all these birds. If there was some way for every smuggled, poached or illegally acquired bird to know there was a place for them to go, to know that their lives would be um, taken care of and that there would be some sort of disposition that was in line with ethical and moral values. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And euthanasia does come in. It's unfortunate. Um, there's nothing worse for, for veterinarians than euthanizing healthy baby animals. There's nothing worse for people who care for them to see that happen. And there's, there's nothing um, that could be more upsetting and more disparaging than considerations of, of mass euthanasia of animals that had they been left alone would have been left flying where they are. So what can we actually do? Solutions, again, donate to organizations that support parrot conservation, donate to those people doing this on the ground, donate and help those people have the funds to do what they're doing because we're not there. You know, we're, we're not on the ground trying to do this. Volunteer, sometimes volunteering is just education. Sometimes it's letting people know it's discussing the plight of these birds. Um, you know, witnessing the lives of these birds. Ecotourism, some ecotourism really puts money into the economies so that maybe they have more money coming in and they're not relying on having to sell stolen baby birds to survive. So consider supporting ecotourism in these communities and always, always try to see these birds in the natural world. If you haven't, it's life-changing. See these birds in the natural world. Reduce your impact. We need to do that beyond bird poaching. We all need to reduce our carbon footprint and pay attention to climate change. And then, you know, promote the establishment of conservation parks, ways to protect these birds, better um, 
funding for research, better funding for caring for these birds and habitat restoration. A lot of the, the big issues that face the world. If anybody's interested, um, allianceforparrots.org is gonna hold their Parrot Crisis Summit this October. It is free. I'd love their catchphrase, save parrots, save people, save the planet. Um, if you go to that website, you can register for that and they'll send you a link um, and it'll be a virtual discussion of everything we've talked about here, but from people who are doing it on the ground, people who are in Guatemala, people who are in Nicaragua, people who are going around and seeing these empty nest cavities and seeing their birds poached and, and seeing people who are trying to help these birds injured or even sometimes murdered when they try to help these birds. So just a plug for this upcoming I uh, worked with some people over the last year to have the Association of Avian Veterinarians have a position statement on wildlife trafficking specific to birds. And it, it, it may not seem like it, but it's an undertaking. But if you can get a reputable organization to have a position statement, sometimes this is even valuable in legal cases. Sometimes a lawyer can use this. If you can say a reputable organization is against what you're doing, it's widely accepted from membership and people who work with birds, care about them, love them, provide veterinary care, feel like that. And if you, you, know, you read what it says here, wildlife trafficking or the movement of these birds poses significant health and safety risks for humans and animals. We've talked so much about how these birds suffer in the process but there are risks on a global level and it goes a lot more far reaching. Putting an end to this illegal trade probably never happened and probably never happened in our lifetimes is critical for species conservation. We have to think about the effects that illegal smuggling and poaching and wildlife trafficking has on wild populations. So um, I'm glad that we have this position statement. So ending now with a couple last slides and then we'll have some time for some questions. Um, what do we hope for? Money, somebody to pay for this and finding funding. Easier said than done, but finding funding, finding people who work and provide oversight. Um, you know, basically we're countering some of the things that we discussed as problems with these are solutions, but how do they really happen? Clear and transparent agreements. We talked about earlier the Fish and Wildlife Service, the USDA, Customs and Border Control, how those organizations work together to create what we hope is an ideal way to ensure the safety and the protection of these birds, defining their roles and what they can do. We want to agree that the disposition in these birds is not to become pets, ideally. The most ideal would be, can we get these birds back to where they came from? We talked about how that's very difficult, very, inex very expensive and almost impossible, but it's happening more. And then if we have to euthanize these birds, I would love it if it was for humane reasons to alleviate suffering and not because of convenience, not because we don't have any place for them to go. We don't have money and you know we don't have any other option. We don't wanna have to just euthanize these birds out of convenience. And I think that's what we all would hope for. What else do we hope for? You know, We wanna know where these birds can go. We wanna know that these birds can have adequate testing and care when they're in quarantine. It's impractical that personnel be restricted um, and not trained and not taught and not aware of how to care for and provide the needs for these birds. These neonates and baby birds need care sooner than they often get it. And many of them die along the process, even with our best attempt just to get them care because they're so young and sensitive. And we need to make sure that we have contingency planning, that we have arrangements made and that we have organizations and volunteers and people who can help with this more than those that are available. And lastly, what are the professional and personal rewards? Anybody that is educating, talking about the plight of these birds, telling their friends and neighbors, talking about it on social media, those are all small steps to improve health, welfare, and well-being of what we like to call the avian victims of the pet trade. We do know that demand for birds plays a big part of it. That gets into the ethics and issues related to how we have birds to keep as pets and keep those birds that we love in our homes. Working with these confiscated birds can be rewarding. Saving their lives can be rewarding. It fills a need. It teaches people to care about birds. You know, studies have shown that if children are exposed to animals when they're young, 
it teaches them to like them. It teaches them to love them. Children who visit zoos when they're young are more likely to care about animals. And we know that we can all play a role in that. We, again, all can have a, a, a hand in the rewards of what it means, wider networking and improving what happens in the pet trade. And again, what can we do? Maybe we just change the world one bird at a time. There's a saying that it may not change the world, but it changes that bird's world. And I think that's what's really important. So I wanna just send a special thank you to Pat Lattice. She's a veterinarian. She works with um, many of these birds that are smuggled in and she's a big part of putting this um, presentation together. And this is information that she and I have presented in the past and will continue to share with anybody willing to listen. So I thank you very, very much for the opportunity and to share this information. I hope it was informative most of all. I hope people take some important key messages and have learned how quarantine, how uh, you know the, the process of how things work to try to protect and save these birds. But I hope people also take away from it the immense suffering and what a tragedy we've created with the smuggling and the illegal wildlife trade. So thank you very much. Wow. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Plain. That, that's um, it's an important conversation that you just had with us. And I appreciate you going through that. It's just, uh, wow, I'm a little teared up over it. It's uh, it's quite uh, quite a, quite an undertaking. Um, uh, wow. I, I'm a little, uh, did you mention that um, the the quarantine facility is in New York. Is that like one of the main processing centers for confiscated birds? It is, is that... the only USDA facility in the U.S. that will take confiscated birds. Correct. That that's uh, that that just seems um, fascinating because uh, I I just when I think of birds coming like through here illegally, I, I think of like the border of you know California and Texas and 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 in those areas, and so I'm just surprised that there isn't one like in you know, those areas, like the border of California or Texas. Exactly. Or, That's exactly where they need to be, you know? So they go to New York and then they, that they go from here, like say, cause I'm in Cal Southern California. So the bird would, the bird, if they had birds that came in illegally here, they would be sent to New York. I mean, possibly to. Correct. I mean, it, it, once Fish and Wildlife Service took possession of those birds, they have to go into quarantine unless they're going to send them back across the border or back where they came from or in some way refuse them entry. But yes, that's the, the poached or confiscated bird quarantine facility in the U.S. is that one that operates in New York. Wow. OK. It just seems like a, a waste of resources, so to speak, just to transport them that way from areas that are so not very close. And that's the point of sort of everything that happens in that initial slide I had with that quote, that harm happens to these birds all along the way, even at the points where we're well, well meaning. Wow. Okay. Um, whew, okay. Uh, so we have a question um, from, uh, from Frank wants to know, is there a list of the most reputable organizations to donate to help, to help the parrots, to help the, it, that's, yeah. Like yeah. where you want to help today, where, where, where can they go? Yeah, there's a there's a number of organizations. There's a number of of people working. Uh, there are people who work on this um, sort of lobbying for funding and money, and there are people who are actually out there right now as we speak, trying to set up protections on the ground. They're hiking through through the woods in Honduras, trying to count nests, trying to protect birds, trying to teach local people how to care for birds, you know, ways to, to change that. Uh, there are a number of organizations and a number of, of groups that are affiliated with those doing this. Um, you know, and, and I can provide that information. One of the groups I know is One Earth Conservation and they are um, affiliated where I put that link about the Christ parrot crisis at the Alliance for parrots.org. But One Earth Conservation is, is doing a lot of this work as well as trying to educate people, set up training and even come up with other ways for money making. So it's not just stealing baby birds. Um, a number of other organizations work towards the protection of these birds um, by way of different methods in different ways, but, but that information exists out there. And there are people that the short answer to that question is if people have specifics, there are people that can cross check and verify and make sure. I mean, if you Googled and looked for information on, on these organizations, they may or may not be legitimate or they may or may not be using their funding to actually help the birds. Mm 
So yes, that information is out there, can be shared, can be verified, and people can be put in touch with people to verify if an organization they want to help is legitimate and honest and the right one. Okay. And, and you, you had touched upon, I mean, uh, poverty is a, a driving a driver behind a lot of these, you know, poached parrots. And uh, I, years and years ago, back in my bird talk days, I was fortunate enough to go on an echo tour. And one of the interesting, uh, one of the amazing parts was the, the, the people who led the, the tours to see the macaws in the wild, they were former poachers and they preferred to much rather lead tours of, you know, tourists, bird enthusiasts to see these wonderful birds in the wild than pull their babies from the nests, you know, but they, they know all the locations of the birds from them, yeah. but they were, they were very proud to be leading tours as opposed to being poachers. Um, and that's, so that's a great point. I mean, that fits in with this and, and methods for po impoverished communities to have other ways to make money. And, if there are people that can set up the poachers to make money being tour guides, they'll choose to do that, you know, and, and other methods of doing that. There are many other ways for ecotourism and housing and lodging and bird hikes and bird tours and, and all of those type of things where people can be utilized, but somebody has to make sure that money gets to them in order for them to stay. So that's a great point. And it's encouraging to hear that as well. And that should have been added to my solution slide, you know, where, where we're figuring out ways to get people to do things to make money other than steal birds. All right. And then uh, Marguerite asked, does CITES, uh, do, they, do they fund anything? Do they, do they have any funds that can that go towards this? The, or are they... Usually not. I mean, it's it's hard for, for funding to come from a source like that. I mean, the, they're, they're conservation protection, but to actually pay and have money transfer between organizations, my understanding is no, there's not funding coming from them for this. Okay. Okay. Um, wow. I'm so digesting like all the information and uh, it's, I'm, I'm really glad there's a recording of this so people can go back and, and also to share with, with other, you know, with, with, with other people, I mean, not even just your bird loving friends, but just everyone. It's just such a, such a, an important, um, look at the, you know, what's going on behind the scenes of some of the, the pet trade, Ill, illegal pet trade. Um, let's see if we have any other, uh, any other questions. And, um, and so, I'm just curious, like, ha have you, have you, um, had any experience yourself with, with, uh, rehabbing or, or, you know, seeing some of these birds like come through your way, um, as a, as a veterinarian? Yeah. And a lot of times they've come through by way of working with rescue organizations or sanctuaries or those places that are taking these birds in, in an attempt to try to help them. Um, so having those affiliations with those organizations and having those associations puts us in a position to be able to help them and be able to help more of the birds. Okay. Okay. And, and just, um, let's see from coming from like a pet bird enthusiast, like how, how, what are, what would be some signs that like a bird that you, you know, you see advertised like on a online forum that, that it's, it's not one that's been poached from the wild. Are there any like, you know, vesting or are you just. Great question. I love that you answered that. I asked that because the answer is no, there are no ways to tell. Um, it's impossible. I mean, it, it stands to reason that any population of pet bird owners, a percentage of those birds are, are poached, illegally smuggled, wild caught, um, even to this day. So there, there's no real way to know for sure. Unfortunately, captive breeding practices that used to require banding birds or identification or breeder information or any way to control that has largely stopped being enforced. You know, there used to be a regulation that if a bird was captive bred and you put the right size leg band on it at the right age, then you know it had to be captive bred. So um, the, the practice of putting open bands on wild caught birds, well, since 1992, we're not supposed to have wild caught birds. So that has stopped. So the, the correct answer to that important question is there's no way to know. You know, these birds are definitely landing in the pet trade. They're being sold. They're being bought. Countless times somebody may make it across the border just to meet with a dealer. And then that person's got those birds on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace, even though they claim to not allow pet sales, it squeezes through. So there's no real way to know. And that's a sad, harrowing part. Yeah. Years ago, I, I had uh, my, my double yellow head Amazon, um, you know, you know, came here in the uh, 80s. 
I mean, from the from the late eighties, and and I was I was always told that probably a good high probability of being Southern California that might have been a um, it, like Amazon's from that era, you know, in 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 Southern California, we had a good chance of maybe being a illegally brought over. <laughs> definitely, yeah. definitely species. Um, wow. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just like, still like, it, it's just, like, it's just still my, my body's still recovering from the, all the information. It's just so. I appreciate oh, that because so I think that's what we just want that. I mean, we, yeah. those of us that are trying to educate and share and make sure everybody knows, I mean, like we said in the beginning, this is, this is good information for bird people of any level to know what's going on and the truth of it. And to know the truth of it is an imperfect system yeah. in and of itself leads to more suffering. So I do. Yeah, I always, I always think that, you know, we, we kind of owe it to our, our pet companions to know where they're from and, and, and what they're all about. And may, this is another aspect to that of knowing, you know, what's going on in their area of the world and, and to their wild counterparts. It's just something I think that, you know, we owe to them is to understand what, 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 what's involved with that. Right. Yeah. And there's even a comment in the chat and somebody said, you know, species trafficking um, in several countries, including Mexico, they said it's a you know multi-million dollar business and authorities just don't allocate funds or resources or time to, to stop it or to help with it. Again, like I said, sometimes it's culturally accepted and sometimes, you know, much like the political climate in the U.S. right now, you know, priorities. I mean, it's unfortunate, but animal law and animal care may be a low priority for majority of people that can do something about it. So it's a, it's a serious far reaching problem, but it's a global problem and it affects us all. Okay. Wow. Um, whew, okay. Thank you. I have to announce, we, we do give away every, every webinar and I gotta, I gotta announce our webinar winner. Um, it's more of a positive note here. That's going out to Sharon, uh, Sharon Presner. Congratulations. Some strawberry, the new strawberry nutriberries as well as another uh la fever product of your choice so uh those those look really good the strawberry nutriberries by the way birds seem to really like them uh, and they smell great if you have a chance to arroyo arroyo um dr lamb's amazon has has shown some videos of arroyo enjoying those i think endorse them yes <laughs> yes um Okay, and just real, a sneak peek too. We're going to be on uh, 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 with Dr. Uh, Tolly next Friday for another episode of Ask the Vet. So, um, so uh, we we did have a great vet on with us today, Dr. Pilney, uh, uh, covering an important topic. And if you have a, a question about your your bird health, next Friday would be the the, the webinar to log into. Uh, wow. Okay, I really appreciate your I really appreciate this presentation, and uh, I we maybe I hope to have you back for some either related to this or another topic. It's just been great. To, to give us your time in, in, in this fabulous presentation. Thank you. I'm happy to do so. And I appreciate the opportunity. And I would love to continue to have the opportunity when you see it fits, feel free to let me know. I would love to talk about welfare topics and, and ensuring we're doing the right thing with our birds. Great. And someone mentioned earlier, there's someone from your area. They said that they're, they're so fortunate to have uh, so where you stuck a lamb, I have two great vets in their area. They, they, they said they're very, very fortunate. And I, I think I think they are. So thank like, you guys yeah, obviously that. care so much about, you know, it's just, it's great to that you give us your time. So appreciate it. Um, all right, guys, on that note, I got to say goodbye. I got, thanks again. I know you got a busy day and um, until next time, everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you and your flock. Everyone stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.